gold medalist into the hall and on their entrance for the audience to stand and applaud their progress to the platform. Because they enter at the back of the hall, you will need some signal as to when they're entering. <laughs> and I won't use winks and nods or semaphore, but simply exit the platform, and that will be your key for spontaneous applause. <laughs> Thank you. My Lord, ladies and gentlemen, tonight's a celebration of architecture. It's the highlight of, of our year at the RIBA. It's the presentation of the Royal Gold Medal. It's the premier international architecture award, and I'd say that anywhere in the world, and I don't think many people would disagree with me. This year, it's awarded by the Queen. It's the Royal Gold Medal, it's not the RIBA Medal and it's awarded by the Queen on the recommendation of the RIBA. This year, to Norman Foster. I don't intend to read the citation. I should think everybody here knows Norman Foster, and as importantly, if not more so, his work. He's an architect who's produced a series of exciting buildings that give pleasure and delight. And that's really what architecture is all about. His choice of sponsors this evening, to start with, is Sir Robert Sainsbury. He will speak about Norman Foster and his work. Norman's a brave man, because Sir Robert is a client. And I can think of no severer test for an architect, any architect, than ask, to ask his client to come and speak on his behalf after the building is complete, and well and truly completed. So I'd like to ask so Robert Sainz, we to come up and speak this evening. Thank you. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, a short while ago, my wife and I were talking to a senior member of your profession about Norman Foster and his Centre for Visual Arts at the University of East Anglia at Norwich, Norman's first major non-industrial or commercial building. Suddenly, our friend exclaimed in obvious amazement, my God, you mean to say you're still on speaking terms with your architect? Well, obviously, I wouldn't be standing here if we were not indeed good friends with Norman. As our experience of that building has grown, so if possible has our admiration for Norman. Our gratitude to Foster Associates remains undiminished. An examination of, of the varying relationships between professional people uh, and their clients would certainly be very revealing. However, I'm only concerned today with the rapport between Norman and ourselves, resulting, I like to think, in a truly productive relationship, the sort of relationship in which I believe Norman is at his greatest, one which we found unbelievably stimulating. I hope, therefore, that you will excuse me talking about the centre, but really I am not qualified to speak on this particular occasion uh, about anything else. When Norman accepted the commission, the precise site hadn't even been chosen. There was no written brief. There never was one. Norman's task was to give substance to a somewhat ill-defined concept. We wanted him in providing a home for our collection 
to give members of the university the opportunity of looking at works of art in the natural context of their daily work and life. Above all, to give them and visitors to the university the opportunity to enjoy our collection as we had done. Sensual enjoyment being no bar to the pursuit of knowledge or intellectual understanding. All this called for a place in which people could relax, look at works of art in a leisurely manner, if they so wished, or work, read a novel, or just dream away, if that is what they wanted. If this could be achieved, such a place would surely appeal equally to outside scholars and lay members of the public as to men and women in the university. That was Norman's brief, if you can call it that, developed, elaborated in practical terms in the course of many, many hours of discussion and travel during the planning stage. Norman himself has stated, I quote, the building attempts a sensitive but positive response to the collection. Undoubtedly, the building provides to a marked degree the sought-after environment. It equally satisfies the particular gallery needs of a somewhat eclectic collection containing a great deal of sculpture. It is, in our opinion, a measure of Norman's imagination and flexibility, apart from his innate brilliance uh, as an architect. I would add that as we find the building completely satisfying visually, we did not contradict the person who suggested that Norman's building was the greatest work of art in our collection. Although I wasn't wildly taken at last Saturday when a lady in the centre looked around and she turned to me and said, it's so beautiful, if only we didn't have these works of art in it. <laughs> I realise, of course, that there are other points of view about the building. It was, I think, that uh, great American architectural writer, Ada Louise Huxtable, who said that uh, architects are such passionate people. That may or may not be true. I, I wouldn't know. What is true is that Norman's building has aroused extraordinary passions amongst architects and architectural writers, uh, even also amongst some, some art historians, although um, I'm not certain that many of them uh, could be called passionate. There, there has been, on the one hand, intense admiration. On the other, apart from genuine disapproval, a great deal of ill-informed, even hostile criticism. And of course, many attempts by writers just to appear clever. My personal prize goes to the description of the building as a fetishist expressionism. So now, Norman, you know what you have perpetrated. <laughs> it is to me extraordinary that so many commentators, when assessing building, have ignored the present-day needs of an art gallery. Now, as the selected site had no defined area, the initial planning largely determined the size and configuration of the building. Now, there are, of course, numerous advantages in the flexibility provided by having column-free gallery spaces, as in Norman's building. 18,000 square feet on the ground floor and 5,000 square feet on a mezzanine. In the first place, an unencumbered space vastly increases the display potentialities. The importance of this is usually, in my opinion, underestimated. I believe that the usefulness of museums should be determined not just by the number of people who visit them, but by the extent and quality of their experience. And that, in my opinion, is largely conditioned by the way objects are shown. The more I realize 
the generally deplorable standard of museum display and lighting in this country, excuse me, being categorical, the more I am thankful for what Norman has made possible at UEA. There is an idea around that small objects cannot be satisfactorily displayed in a tall building such as the centre. I suggest that the height of a gallery is irrelevant in this context, provided that as at UEA, the space is a comfortable one to be in, and provided that the objects can be displayed at the right height, that is the right height for the average adult, and displayed in freestanding cases of the appropriate size. The same argument can be applied to paintings and drawings, all of which are displayed at UEA on screens related to the human scale. The screens can also be used for breaking up the space and, if empty, as backgrounds to the freestanding cases. Naturally, an inter integral part of the display is the lighting, and possibly Norman's supreme achievement at the centre is the quality of light overall, combined with the lighting of the individual works of art. This is achieved by a combination of natural lighting controlled by photoelectric cells and manually controlled artificial lighting at ceiling level directed at the works of art. There is therefore no lighting in the cases and there is no heat generated on the tops of cases. When the spotlighting is turned off, special security lighting is turned on. All lighting locations are accessible from walkways running across the building within the roof trusses. So no machinery has to be brought in at floor level to change bulbs or to adjust fixtures. One cannot, of course, consider the lighting of a gallery without at the same time considering the allied and controversial problem, conservation. Whilst appreciating what we owe to our conservators, I do not consider it necessary always to pander to their requirements, which are frequently changing and which are often absurd in practical terms. And they say a drawing can be properly viewed and studied whilst on display. It might as well be kept in a suitably constructed vault and just brought out occasionally for scholars. The answer at UEA, apart from the strategic placing of certain works, the answer lies in the perfectly reasonable rotation of the permanent collection. Incidentally, I believe that the latest formula used by the experts is in fact length of display related to intensity of light. With special exhibitions, there is the means of taking protective measures for groups of sensitive works. Apart from display, there are other major advantages of open gallery spaces. Sophisticated detection equipment does not these days obviate the necessity to minimise invigilation costs, something to which I think some architects might have paid more attention. At UEA, the entire display and reception areas can be invigilated by three guards, one at the top of the spiral staircase leading down from the upper entrance, one on the mezzanine, and a third watching the monitor. There are naturally no circulation problems. In fact, complete freedom of movement even for the disabled and in accordance with the basic concept plenty of spaces in which to sit and relax. As will be understood, the university was specially concerned with minimising running costs. However, the building is a practical realisation of Norman's concept that high technology can equate with low energy. As he has explained, the design of the spaces and the nature of the, of the enclosing wall, combined with the engineering of air movements to attempt, 
I consider successfully an alternative to air conditioning with, with its high running costs. Well, ladies and gentlemen, enough of the building except for a postscript. I was recently asked by a, a well-known American ar architect, what is the bucket rating of the centre? One bucket, two buckets, three buckets. I was pleased to be able to say that the centre does not need buckets, although I understand that it is not only in America that buckets are required inside buildings. But at any rate, buckets or no buckets, I still believe strongly that an ongoing relationship as at UEA between architect and client is of paramount importance. In that way, there is the better chance of ensuring the maintenance of standards and the long-term satisfaction with the building for both parties. Mr. President, I am proud that my family's name is associated with Norman Foster's building and very proud to support him here today. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Robert. I'm sure every architect will agree that without a client, an understanding client and a good client, the job of producing good architecture is almost impossible. The client is paramount in that requirement. You know, our IBA president served two years. Sometimes it seems a bit like a life sentence, I must admit. But having said that, most of the, some of my predecessors are in the audience tonight will agree with me that it gives uh, you two opportunities of doing two very pleasurable things, and that's presenting, actually investing the gold medal. Now, last year, we had Lubetkin, possibly the oldest gold medalist at the time he received it. Tonight, I'm very pleased to invest Norman Foster, I think probably is the youngest gold medalist, with his gold medal. President, sir, thank you for presenting me with the Royal Guild Medal for Architecture. It is a very great honour indeed. Thank you also, Sir Robert, for your very generous introduction and the kindness of yourself and Bucky in supporting me this evening. There are many individuals and groups that I would like to thank. Unfortunately, it's just not possible here and now to mention or name all those clients, collaborators, teachers, consultants, manufacturers and contractors, not to mention well-wishers, who have helped us and enabled us to develop and practice our skills as architects. It is a privilege to accept this award, and I'm privileged to accept it on behalf of the many people who have, over the years, made up our practice. I wish that I could communicate to you this evening the enthusiasm, the dedication which binds all of us together as a team, as an office, whether it's a workshop or an office in London, Oslo, Hong Kong. I find the clarity of Sir Henry Wooten's description of architecture in 1624 as firmness, commodity, and delight, quite refreshing in the light of all the current architectural isms, especially as emphasis on people and their needs for convenience and delight. Despite the shifts of social and technological change which have been explosive in the last 300 years, 
the goals suggested by this description still seem to me to be as valid as ever. I would like to elaborate on this in the context of our office. Before I attempt that, it's important that there are no misunderstandings about my own motivations. I practice architecture for the pleasure that I derive from its pursuit, even if at times the disciplines and demands seem quite insuperable. To paraphrase Charles Eames, I like to think that I take my pleasure seriously. In that spirit, I should also mention aviation, not for the occasional pleasure that I derive from it, but because I believe it offers experience and analogies which can inform the world of architecture. As Bucky might say, there is for me a synergetic relationship between the two. I have to tell you that I'm more at home doing, i.e. designing, rather than talking about the subject of design. So I shall mostly be referring to our own work to identify beliefs and attitudes, how they've changed over time and how they're still developing. I shall try to resist the temptation to post-rationalize and to make an effort to communicate a reality, which for me owes a great deal to pragmatism and intuition. I have always believed that architecture is about people. At one extreme, the private inner sanctum that it can create, through to the other extreme of outside public spaces, which are in turn created by it. In between such public and private domains, the edges can be consciously or unconsciously blurred to create or modify communities by sustaining, erecting or breaking down social barriers. Such an approach involves value judgments by attempting to ask the right questions. It suggests an interactive process between those who initiate buildings, those who use them, and those who design them. Another way of saying teamwork. It implies challenge. Such a process may confirm the status quo, may merely be an audit which rubber stamps an existing model as appropriate for duplication. On the other hand, it may lead to building forms that are different, breaking with a current tradition, creating fresh possibilities, or harking back to an earlier tradition. It assumes research and an ordering of priorities. In broad brush terms, such an approach may suggest fragmentation, the creation of several parts rather than one monolith. Alternatively, the process might lead to integration the creation of one entity rather than separate parts. In fundamental terms, it might even question the wisdom of doing a building at all, or suggest thresholds of appropriateness. It has more to do with optimism rather than pessimism. It is about joy and may well be sustained by illusion. The illusion of order in a disordered world, of privacy in the midst of many, of space on a crowded site, of light on a dull day. It is also about quality, quality of space and the light that models it. At some point it involves making a building and unless we return back to the cave it raises the issue of technology, the art of making things, to quote Persig. The production process is a means to an end. I believe that quality, that quality of loving care if you like, has always been a preferred ingredient and it is needed more today than ever before. Architecture exists in a time frame. It cannot be separated from the past. In tangible terms, the context of sight. More intangibly, earlier influences and reference points. But architecture exists quite firmly in the present and assumes an attitude to the future and change. Lastly, it cannot be created in a vacuum. The forces which create it are sustained by resources time, energy, and funds. I should add one further word, the learning curve. Those perceived failures, dissatisfactions, or scores, bonuses, expected or otherwise. Let's call it feedback. When I wrote this, I found myself underlining certain key words and linking them together as threads. The buildings are a complex interweave of these threads and they attempt to reconcile and integrate those often conflicting issues. The conflicts between subjective and objective, the humanistic versus the scientific, the qualitative versus the quantitative. 
I shall, I shall try to pick apart some of these threads with the help of slides. A first group of slides to identify influences and afterwards a second group to talk about those social threads and the response of production. Of course it's a gross oversimplification because there are many overlaps. So I'd like to start with the influences. As a schoolboy, my imagination was fired by two books, Towards a New Architecture by Corbusier and In the Nature of Materials about Frank Lloyd Wright by Russell Hitchcock. They excited me then and they still excite me now. It's become fashionable to denigrate them. I can't join that. They're still my heroes. The list has grown in terms of heroes. I would add Kahn, who goes up in my esteem, I would add Alto, the quality of top light, the way that they model it. Following school, I was a kind of square peg in the round hole of accountancy. I worked for two years marking time in the building on the left, which is Manchester Town Hall. I can still recall it in intimate detail. The glass-sided water systems, the handrails, the cave of a building, designed through and through, at the same point in time, I can remember the opposite of Victorian architecture, kind of cast iron, the liberation, almost the tent, Barton Arcade on the right. If you asked me at that time what a modern building was, I'd have quoted this building, Daily Express Building, in 1939 by Owen Williams. It excited me then and it still excites me now. I marked time for a further two years as an electronics engineer in the RAF, in the kind of turf-covered covered building on the left, which is good on camouflage but no natural light. There was a certain futility, in a sense, because we were servicing radar systems that had been designed for propeller-driven aircraft, and they were being fitted into jets like the one on the right. They were out of phase, and we knew that the navigator, by the time he'd established a fix, that they'd already travelled on a very long way, and the plane was somewhere else. <laughs> For navigator substitute architect, the analogies are uh, fairly obvious. I finally got myself sorted out, a late starter, into architecture school, Manchester University. Many overtones, Bannister Fletcher, Professor Cordingly, and drawing. Drawing on everything except tracing paper, linen, Watman paper, um, no repeatographs, not even graphos, ruling pen the discipline of drawing and of measuring. I broke with a mould of measuring classical buildings. I discovered a world of vernacular architecture, of windmills, barns. I became fascinated by the way that they were made, the way that they were put together. I also, as a parallel stream, became immersed in a similar exercises on urban spaces, pacing them, sketching, photographing, covering a whole range from Tuscany hill towns the quads in Cambridge and Oxford, the circus at Bath, the space at Greenwich, Shepherd's Market. The two parallel themes fascinated me. If I think of the most enjoyable and challenging uh, prospect at the moment, it's undoubtedly the BBC, the broadcasting headquarters, which brings one of many challenges, brings those two threads together, something that will work and something that will respond to the urban context. I moved from Manchester to Yale. Quite diverse influences. Serge Shemayev, who couldn't talk about a building, what it looked like, would only raise questions. Should there be a building of the most philosophical nature? Paul Rudolph, who couldn't talk about questions, couldn't talk about a building unless there was a model or a drawing. Scully, who opened my eyes to Frank Lloyd Wright, the Frank Lloyd Wright that I'd seen as a schoolboy, who was a kind of science fiction architecture with quirky furniture. He introduced me to a continuum of history rather than being separate pigeonholes. I met Richard Rogers and developed a very fruitful relationship which carried on into my return to England. This particular building as a project was typical. It was probably about a three-week project. I learned a lot about self-pacing and working against the stopwatch. The building consists of bridges of flexible space between towers of structure structure and vertical circulation and services. It could be a word picture for the current proposal for the Hong Kong Bank. But America was much more. It was the fascination of a kind of rich imagery of artifacts. 
And I find the juxtaposition of these two images quite interesting on a number of counts. The liberation, the autonomy, the autonomy of the dwelling, the mobility, separate by years, separate by planets. And the expression of that in the one case, smooth and appropriately streamlined, in the other appropriately articulated. That whole world of space, of energy harvesting, seems to me to have tremendous potential and excitement for the future. And the solar, the mirrors on the left, been used very recently to explain uh, the possibilities of scooping sun into the heart of the banking hall on the Hong Kong project. The world of space and the buildings that it creates excite me at a pure aesthetic level, the thrill of going inside that kind of space. For quite different reasons, the objects on the right-hand side excite me and also for the spin-off potential, the Jumbo, the 747, which is supporting the Space Shuttle, has informed a whole new range of material flooring systems in current projects. The Space Shuttle and the subcontractors who've been involved with it, people like Corning Glass, suggest a whole new exciting range of materials that can have a luminosity, a luminosity that I haven't seen except in traditional oriental architecture, but with very, very high thermal efficiency amazing joyful materials and the possibility of those lightweight floors which in turn rather like the tatami mat can order, can humanize, can be expressed, can break down the scale of office spaces in the same way that the expression of a structure both inside and out can humanize and modify those spaces. But there is another thing that I've discovered and become excited about in that tra traditional Japanese architecture. It's the sequence of spaces from the outside to the inside the transition spaces, which I think is something that we will certainly be striving for in future projects. I can sense that in Paris, in that kind of in-between world between the outside public space and the inner parts of a restaurant, the kind of sidewalk cafe. The bridge has been used recently to make certain analogies with buildings. The manner in which a bridge is functional in that it can get you from one side of the water to the other. But it exists as more than a structure. It exists symbolically. It has a presence. It has an announcement. It will appear on postcards, on travel posters. It is far more than a functional crossing device. And that has been referred to in a number of presentations, not the least on the, on the bank. Moving to the bank in Hong Kong, the observation of the manner in which in that climate people will use parasols not to ward off rain but to ward off the sun. The way in that that has informed a past tradition of architecture by creating a generosity of shade and the kind of filigree and detailing that that produces, the interest, the breakdown of scale, the humanity that it imparts into the architecture. A humanity that is totally missing in the kind of example as a negative example on the right hand side. On the left is a slide which is a very, very rare site in Hong Kong. You have to seek them out. It's a kind of anonymous building which has grown up over time and acquired this kind of uh, patina of uh, landscaping, of signs, of balconies, of modifying devices. And that richness seemed in sharp, welcome contrast, the kind of concrete jungle of towers. Some slides that have been used recently in the dialogue with the BBC um, to explain the potential of the site, the Middleton Gardens currently locked as a private, unusable space, compared with, for example, on the left-hand side, Paley Park in New York, kind of marvelous oasis of almost a identical size, full of life, full of people, calm, quiet, water, coffee, in the same way that Marlborough High Street and its social focus has been used in conversations with many people ranging from those who have initiated that project, whether that's Lord Howard or the many people subsequently um, that we've been into a dialogue determining what is the appropriate requirements the brief on that site and bringing together that social focus. Many points made by the High Street 
also used in those conversations about the nature of linkage between an old building and a new building, which may be underground, and the question of identities, identities between different networks, different radio networks, different pro production groups, the vitality of an organization like that, which depends on those individual groups having their own identity, and making analogies with the Kasbah in Marrakesh and the fact that that is uh, a winding route with individual traders and all incredibly different, uh, great vitality. The Galleria in Milan, as a wonderful, noble, top-lit space, rich in excitement with cafes, with bookshops, the possibilities of that kind of urbanity also informing the BBC project. A slide which has also been used to explore and to discuss the concept of creating public space at ground level where it didn't exist in Hong Kong with the bank a project initiated by the chairman Michael Sandberg and many, many, many discussions using this slide as an example and interestingly I have a number of slides of the Galleria and my first one was taken when I was a student and moving around and measuring those urban spaces. Again, a continuing sustaining influence. Structures which you move up in, the Eiffel Tower, the whole drama of vertical movement in a building. Again, something that I rarely find in new tall buildings. Certain exceptions may be in things like the Bradbury building where you move up in the heart of the space. Again, analogies with that and the bank building. Different kind of structures, lightweight structures, source material, agricultural buildings. The grain elevators on the right hand side, the detail from it could almost be like a Snelson sculpture. And influences right down to buttercups if you like. Is the structure here yellow because of buttercups in a field or is it yellow because yellow is the Renault house color? I honestly don't really know. The important thing seems to be that it should be a friendly inviting building which leads us on to the next group of threads to pick apart those threads which are concerned the social thread if you like with people from the private to the public, the interrelationship with the site. And then the way that that will be woven in with the production process, the means of realizing the building. If I start with two images which are typical of the early work, the early work of Team 4 which brought together two architects who were sisters, Wendy Cheeseman, Georgie Walton, and Richard Rogers and myself. At that time the schemes had an organic response to the site. They were largely dug in. They were hugely influenced by the Shemayev work in Yale on community and privacy. Invariably they had hard sides to a car route. They would open up to view and sun. They would be in village-like clusters. They were anti-suburban in intent. They integrated landscaping reminiscent on the left hand side of a later uh, version on the Willis Faber roof which was public rather than in this instance uh, entirely inaccessible but part of, uh, of an integration into the landscape and continuing through to now individual buildings no matter how small were seen as models for application in larger schemes at that time sadly unbuilt. A turning point beyond that was Reliance Controls. A client, Peter Paul Hune, who'd in interviewed a number of package dealers who'd come forward with proposals for a building for a small electronics factory, 120,000 square feet, correction, 32,000 square feet, five pounds a square foot, 120,000 pounds. And that budget had been set by proposals from industry. On the left-hand side is typical of those proposals a kind of office building at the front and a shed at the back. The management box, the worker's shed, the we and they, the posh and scruffy, the clean and dirty. The building tried to challenge that. The commercial constraints were set by those buildings but with a creative client they were challenged and the result was much more in the nature of a democratic box which 
was free, was open. The relationship between the production and the administration could change over time. The realization of that was a turning point in terms of its emphasis on component construction. But there is a certain illusion. I'm sure that Richard would be the first to agree with me that really it's closer to a kind of aesthetic of bent cocoa tins rather than the machine aesthetic. There was very much a fudge factor. The components, although they came out of a catalogue, bore no relationship to the potential for adjoining components. But in integration terms, it was quite fascinating. If it integrated socially by under one roof, bringing together those people who would otherwise be separate, it also integrated in the way that it would pull light tubes into corrugated decks, the way that it would double use in the floor, very much in a process of, of integration, a process that had been taken much further. Moving from that to, for me, an important turning point as a building, the work for Olson's in the docks. Fred Olson, who'd taken a very personal, very entrepreneurial initiative, very strong belief in social values, and the building attempted to reflect that. But it started by an attempt to ask the right questions. It was created out of a dialogue. I must say that I've never seen the effect on a group of people in my life before. Dock workers with a reputation for vandalizing everything that they came in contact with. Dock workers who couldn't coexist in the same building, I was told, because of their language with secretaries and so on. The transformation was absolutely unbelievable. They became so possessive about this building they wouldn't even allow visiting truck drivers in. Quite extraordinary. Because, quote, the truck drivers are dirty people, they vandalize, they swear. Um, I'm not suggesting the architecture did that in isolation. That would be a nonsense. I would like to believe that it was a reflection of the patronage, if you like, of Olson's as a company and the individuals that we were working with. Technically, it was certainly an advance on reliance. The components were more sophisticated and the tolerances were greater. Correction, the tolerances were tighter. It was also an influential building in the sense that it was our first building, Wendy and myself, as Foster Associates, after we disbanded Team 4. It was also influential in that Olson's generously opened their doors to many potential clients. Sir Robert... Sainsbury, IBM, Willis Faber. It was instrumental in opening up many future possibilities with other enlightened clients. There was a staging point called the Newport Comprehensive School Competition. Image on the left, it's essentially a kind of serviced ceiling, an umbrella that would be able to transmit light, natural light, artificial light, move air, power, be able to plug into it. It was inspired by the California SCSD school system, which in turn, in my view, was a more rationalized outcome of the Eames House. At that time also, we were interested in higher performance solutions, which might be erected more quickly and at lower cost. The air structure on the right for computer technology um, was a built example of that. The comprehensive school wasn't built as a school. It was premiated but it didn't win the competition. But it was a model for a building for IBM, another extraordinarily enlightened client, who were prepared to work with us in an endeavor to challenge the basis of the accommodation on the right. The accommodation on the right was typical of temporary buildings, occupying about half the stock of IBM real estate. The time was known, the cost was known. The building on the left took some of the principles which I described earlier, grouped people more compactly together rather than producing a kind of fragmentation of individual buildings, so much so that it sustained the illusion of a park on the edge of suburbia. Trees were preserved, a compact building was created, almost a classic pavilion, a building which has changed over time, has been changing ever since, and probably will continue to change as IBM's individual operation there changes over time, such as the volatile nature of that particular industry. Moving from that to a building in Ipswich for Willis Faber. 
very close involvement of the chairman then and continuity of the chairman of Willis Faber since. But moving back to the opening of that building, the start of the process, the start of the process was really a challenge to whether it was necessary to continue the tradition of high-rise buildings in terms of the social conditions within them in an area which was quite questionable. The edge of a market town and if it created an embarrassment within then the kind of sore thumb of these buildings and the kind of waste spaces, windswept plazas that they created at the base seemed quite alien to everything that a market town should be about. In terms of challenging that, the response was a low-profile building, a building that would extend to the edge of the site and would attempt to recreate that winding medieval random geometry of a street pattern. Within, the building attempted to challenge what an office building might be about, to inject some joy, some sunlight, some movement, the possibility of a swimming pool, the swimming pool at ground level, generous movement through the sun to a roof garden, a usable outdoor space. These, I've heard on a number of occasions, standing in the background, the then company secretary, Ken Knight, who went with this project from day one with the backing of the chairman at that time and chairman subsequently up to his recent retirement and explaining to a number of people that the movement through the building, the escalators, that the way that people reacted to each other in the morning and the evening as they passed, that that was really what knit the 1,300 people there into a family unit. I believe that the social aspects of this building are to me far more important than some of the other aspects, such as the designing of components. It was a turning point in that sense, technically. The response, the means to those ends. We'd indicated on the Newport School the possibility of actually designing components rather than taking them out of a catalogue, which was a turning point in reliance. And that, on this project, harnessed the, in the interest of industry, who then ran with it, to produce a proprietary product. The right-hand slide reminds me that we also, at that time, were starting to move into prototypes, into mock-ups, so that the site wasn't the place to learn on, in an endeavour to raise quality, to get higher performance, to get something that would be more joyful. On the right hand side also, not may be apparent, the fact that this building had a suspended floor. A suspended floor at that time was thought to be very way out, surely only appropriate for computers. It's interesting that it's now become almost a norm in many developers' buildings. And it's certainly been a commercial lifeline to that company who've been able to take on board newer technologies by virtue of that particular feature so that they've expanded their production without necessarily having to go into a new building program. Willis Faber on larger scale created a project under the initiation of Kenneth Robinson who was then the chairman for Hammersmith. There are a number of features which are apparent in this building the kind of membranes reminiscent in a way of that air-supported structure for computer technology. The kind of sun in the heart of the building, large scale of Willis Faber. The possibility of entrance gates at the corners, in some ways perhaps reminiscent of the church on the adjoining site. One could talk about these, but much more fundamentally was the abolition of that dreadful traffic roundabout. The fact that it could move away and a park could be created alongside. It was the goal of a triangular force, if you like, between getting something that in the absence of subsidies would be able to sustain itself financially. That was the first point. The second point, something that would work operationally. It was a transportation interchange. It would have to work for tube tra trains and buses. And thirdly, it would have to work for people. It would have to work for the community. I talked at the outset about the threshold of appropriateness. And when changes were such, that it wasn't going to be a triangle and only two of those would be left and there wouldn't be a community heart in that it would be a regular high street development then we felt it was appropriate to withdraw and with hindsight I'm absolutely convinced that that was the right decision at the time moving across to integration of a different nature which Sir Robert has talked about at length the integration of a collection private collection of works of art into a university and then in the building itself, smaller scale, 
the integration of quite diverse activities under one roof for the cross-fertilization that could be sparked between those areas concerned with the display for the contemplation of works of art, the attempt to create a noble, generous, relaxing living area, living space for it, alongside the teaching areas concerned with the teaching of the history of art and the integration of public spaces within it. So Robert has talked at length about that, about the devices to that end. Certainly it wouldn't have been possible without the then Vice-Chancellor, Professor Thistlethwaite, the university who were able to realize the building, the partnership between us all, and in terms of seeking the performance goals that have been described, a lateral transfer at this point, again another perhaps turning point on the production process, a transfer of technology from aerospace industry into the building, superplastic aluminium which would achieve building components more integrated, higher performance and would do more than just keep out the rain. I talked about joy, I would talk about joy in terms, of, uh, in terms of the people who inhabit buildings, I would also talk about joy in terms of the materials themselves, the potential for a richer vocabulary. This is the competition that we won in Frankfurt for, um, for a national German indoor athletic stadium. The progression here I would say is interesting in that it takes further that integration of a roof, a thin membrane, that can incorporate natural lighting, the services, the structure. It's reminiscent in some ways of those earlier Team 4 projects and the way that it digs itself into the site far more organically. And I would submit in one sense it's more functional than some of the other buildings. It's more functional in the sense that the entrance space announces itself far more audibly. To Hong Kong and the competition for the bank headquarters Hong Kong is a city of skyscrapers. I'm told there are more there than any other city in the world. The kind of spaces, the traffic, the manner in which the pedestrians are relegated to very much third place. Slide on the right, not untypical, of pedestrians moving under roads. The kind of inhumanity of those buildings, the anonymity of them, both from the inside and the outside, was something that we felt it was important to challenge. And as a starting point, the possibility of actually physically lifting a building into the air to free the ground plane, to create an extension of an existing urban space, to create a public plaza at the base of this building. I use the doodle on the left-hand side rather than the more complex drawn-to-scale section on the right. It was a fast doodle to try and explain what the building was about in its essence. And those shaded areas up the building are reception areas in the double height part of a structure which would be gardens in the sky so that there would be a sequence of space from the plaza the main generous entrance space into a lift release into a larger space in one movement the lift only stopping at those landscaped areas up the building and then by escalators very much in the manner of the Willis Faber building to more gently traverse to spaces above and below. An analogy, if you like, close in spirit to a vertical cluster, a series of village-like clusters, one on top of the other. And diagram there, the sun scoop that would be able to pull sun and light into the heart of that building and possibly through a glass floor in the plaza to illuminate the kind of cave part, the vault of the building below. Three elements, if you like, the cage of the building above, the public space, the plaza running through, and the cave below. The first drawing on the scheme was by a man whose name is written in Chinese and also English on the left-hand side, and brings forward a number of the sort of subjective aspects, but very important aspects, behind this building, or indeed many buildings, all buildings, if you like, in Hong Kong. The whole issue of feng shui. And it's interesting that that Geomancer, um, that the spirit of that sketch still finds its way firmly into the latest models on the scheme. The model on the right hand side showing the way that that space continues and also the manner in which grillages may be reminiscent of traditional architecture, may be having overtones of security. Security not only against the typhoons that they're designed to protect that space against in the event of a typhoon when they lower down, 
but also may be symbolic of the fact that this is a bank and it is a secure place. The two slides on the left, you will never be able to make out what they are. They're two checklists for flying a light twin. One on the top is in black. And that's the checklist when all goes well. One at the bottom is in red when it all goes wrong. And it's the emergency checklist. And there are really two kinds of pilots. Those who take off, and when the engine stops on takeoff, they're surprised. Those who take off, and when the engine continues going, they're even more surprised. <laughs> because they expect the worst. There are various adages like, there are old pilots and bold pilots, but there are no old, bold pilots. <laughs> I think it's a bit like that as architects. We expect the worst, we're prepared for the worst, it will never guard us against the worst, Murphy's Law sees to that, but if nothing else, it inspires a spirit of testing. And the gentleman up the ladder there on the right hand slide is peering to see if he can see the water leaking through the prototype Sainsbury Centre panels a process which has continued on other projects. The chopped off aircraft on the left hand side is doing its darndest to push water at Typhoon Force into a mock-up prototype assembly of the glass wall for the Hong Kong building and testing it to the point where it goes beyond the Typhoon loads, testing deflections. The slide on the right, if the left is at Couples in St. Louis, the slide on the right is in New London, Ontario, it's in their wind tunnel testing the whole effect on the facade, the microclimate, the kind of uh, conditions that you would expect on that public plaza, which also inform those red grillages to modify that climate directly as a result of the wind tunnel test. But if I talk about tests, then I'm talking about tests not only at a quantitative level, I'm also talking about those tests at a qualitative level. In other words, does, it, does the end process of that look right? Does it feel good? Does it give some joy? Does it achieve those architectural aims of breaking down the scale, giving a filigree of detail, responding to the climate, creating a building which is more human, more enjoyable, both inside and outside? And if the answer is no, then it's really almost of academic importance whether it meets the other tests. The testing of that in terms of artificial skies on the left hand side in Innsbruck where there's the largest artificial sky available in Europe testing the effect of those grillages on the right hand side a very large scale model of the banking hall to be able with lasers and other devices to be able to determine the nature of the sun scoop the way that that, that light would be reflected into the heart of that space would we want it as a soft diffuse light or would we want the brilliance, the harshness, almost the dazzle, dazzle of a sunbeam? And then the quality of a glass floor, what would it look like and how far can we go to demonstrate that and to communicate it to others? The slide on the left hand side gives a view of how that looks on a model. On the right hand side is a part of our office. I don't really quite know whether to say office, workshop, warehouse or whatever. Um, because I think the edges get very blurred in terms of the way that we work as architects. The group to the left of that, making a film of it for communication in Hong Kong. The whole question of mock-ups and prototypes. On the left is a module. You can get an idea of the scale of that by the man standing on the right of it. That is a translation from a model which is about a meter long which was made in timber and plastic. And on the left is a full-size model as a mock-up, also made out of timber and plastic in Tokyo. The eventual transformation of that in southern Japan, the Arco works, is on the right-hand side. And rather than show the whole thing, the testing was quite interesting. It didn't work in the first instance, so it was a good job it was tested. It was the right place to find out how to make it work rather than finding out on site. But I draw attention to the, the ritual of leaving shoes at the threshold. I talked about loving care earlier. I talked about working with industry, about people. 
and certainly the possibility in this instance of last year, for example, being able to design down to the detail of ashtrays, toilet roll holders, ceramic ware, taps, was only really possible with this kind of attitude of mind as a partnership with industry. A progress shot on site on the left-hand side, now way out of date. The building has already gone up to 10 stories and is moving down below three stories below ground, simultaneously building up and also building down. You get an idea of the space which is liberated in that particular very, very busy part of Hong Kong. What it doesn't give a clue to, unfortunately, is the possibility inherent in the scheme of linking spaces at the back, those green spaces of battery path, pulling them, extending the whole pedestrian urban domain in the heart of Hong Kong with a scheme for the extension of Statue Square out to the water's edge. The montage on the right hand side giving some clues about the building and also in a way making a point about some techniques of bringing together photography and more traditional model making skills the kind of traditional model making skills which we might see in one part of one of our bases, um, traditional model making, but in the background there, you can see full size mock ups of a lift car, parts of the bank, and on the right hand side, the kind of activities that are, that are typical of that part of our office or workshop or whatever one calls it. The links with production, with actually making, are really quite important. The people on the right hand side are those designers in the office involved with the furniture on the left. Furniture which is again a model for a possible later production run. Quite interesting that relationship with almost a kind of cottage industry. Really very, very much towards that, that linkage of, of making. Very, very impossible to separate out. If I contrast these two images of this building, recent building for Renault, it's in a way to try and make the point to myself that I find it very difficult to indulge in dogmas. Whether block work is appropriate, the block work on the right hand side giving something like an hour's protection, whereas in other parts of that same building there are materials which have been used in, around the Rolls Royce jets in Harriers which give two hours, two hours plus performance between moving parts as a kind of metalized cloth. Equally dogmatic to say whether a structure should be express, expressed outside or inside. At the same time that we're doing this building, we're also doing work on Third London Airport at Stansted, which for very, very different reasons has a structure within it. In some buildings the services may be expressed, in others not expressed. Very, very difficult to, uh, to have that dogma, if you like. But the slide on the right-hand side does show, I would like to think, that same concern with quality, with the control of quality, regardless of whether it's a so-called traditionally based trade or an untraditional. I'd like to finish on, almost finish, on these two slides. I've used the analogy of the glider quite repeatedly to communicate points about objects which are intrinsically beautiful in themselves. They exist in their own right as beautiful objects. If it never flew, it would be quite compelling. The fact that it can achieve such high performance with low energy, with new materials, is in my view expanded by the work of Paul McCready. The solar-powered aircraft on the right-hand slide in the tradition of his first man-powered flight exist as objects in their own right. But interestingly, as Bucky pointed out when we were together with McCready a few years back at the Aspen conference, if it hadn't been for those newer materials, then certainly the man-powered flight, the achievement of those dreams, wouldn't have been possible. When challenged, Paul McCready talking about the creative aspect of his work, made the point that the prime mover, 
the really creative, the really sort of the brave, the challenging, the aspect of his work was really Kramer, because Kramer was the man who'd put up the funds, who'd researched it, who was prepared to work at it, who'd set the challenge, which had enabled McCready and his team to respond to it. And McCready was quick to add that he might find himself in the position of a spokesman speaking for a larger team because would it have been possible without Brian Allen who peddled? Would it have been possible without the scores of people who clustered around that project and made it possible? Manifestly, it wouldn't. And in terms of this evening, I can't stress too strongly how, as an analogy, that seems to me appropriate about the Royal Gold Medal for Architecture. Because if it isn't for the initiative by those patrons that I've mentioned and those that I haven't mentioned, then we wouldn't be able to exercise our creative skills as architects. And if it wasn't for the team, the offices of a, of a team, then that would be manifestly impossible. And I don't know how to start this evening to, as I said earlier, communicate that dedication, that enthusiasm that binds us all together as a team, wherever we are. That cannot be stressed too much. And finally, two special people. My wife in this slide, a powerful creative driving force, reticent behind the scenes, undoubtedly my sternest critic. I'd like to pay tribute to Wendy. Bucky, likewise, I wouldn't know where to start about saying how much of a privilege it is to work for and with Bucky. An inspiration, a continuing inspiration. I hope we'll live up to that inspiration and I hope we'll live up to the Royal Gold Medal. Thank you. I don't have to say anything, uh, you've just said it. I'd now like to ask Dr. Buckminster Fuller to come and speak. Bucky. Born in the uh, 1895, quite a long time ago. <laughs> and I've lived through very great changes in potentials of humanity, the accomplishments of humanity. I really, having been through those experiences and, and, and having <coughs> radio participation in technology. I can't tell you how moved I am by the talk that you gave Norman. It was magnificent. I'd like to, if I can, put Norman and our present experiences here into perspective, trying to understand a little about what's going on in this relation to what we're, we've just been witnessing and hearing into where humanity now is and where we may be going. 
have to recognize that humans have a capability absolutely unique in our, as far as our knowledge goes in this universe. Many creatures have brains. The brains of all creatures are all coordinating information coming from outside the creature, bring that information inside the skull into the brain, and giving the, that creature then information about its environment, stimulus, all the information is always special case. It smells a little differently from that. <laughs> but humans have, in addition to this brain, which many creatures have, mind. And mind has incredible capability, not manifest by any others than human beings, as far as we know. Human mind has the capability to discover from time to time relationships existing between the special cases that in no way manifest by any uh, smelling, touching, seeing, and hearing. <laughs> Going back to Kepler with the beautiful instruments to make observation, discovering that planets were all different sizes, different distances from the sun, all going around the sun at different rates, seemingly very disorderly, but as Kepler said, they at least were doing one thing in common, they were all going around the sun. <laughs> and scientifically, if you mathematically, if you know one thing, a constant. If you know two things, you're very much more capable of discovering as you have your two eyes to give you range finding. <laughs> so he said, if I can give something else in common to those planets, I might be able to f discover a whole lot more. He said, I'm going to give each one of them the same increment of calendar time, right to the second. <laughs> I have enough data now, I know just right. Each one is a starting this 21 days. I make a diagram of that radii, each one of these distances. At the end of the 21 days, there's new radii from the same sun. There's also then the arc that was traveled. Filled in, made a closed diagram, triangular. He said, I might as well calculate the areas of these triangles, as much as I have the data, and I'm trying to find my way here. Imagine if you were Kepler and doing this, and around the areas were not similar, but there were elegantly, mathematically, exactly the same area. So you can't come out with the same number unless you're coordinating. <laughs> These obstacles are not touching each other like gears to coordinate. They're millions of miles apart. How can they coordinate in millions of miles apart, weighing what they do? Here was here's a human mind discovering a relationship going on. You couldn't smell, to see, touch, or hear. It's a human mind. Others came He's also saying, I see that they are moving in ellipses. And I know that if I want to draw a circle, all I need is a pen and a string and a pen pencil. If I want to make an ellipse, I have to have two restraints. And I didn't know because they're going around the sun at different rates at times, and they bunch together <laughs> much more than others. And the bunch part group begin to affect the non-bunched in pulling, making a second pull. So there's obviously clearly a tension pulling through the universe here, over millions and millions of miles. His, his, his human mind, the great difference. Humans are now, all of us, uh, out of that came across <coughs> Galileo measuring the rate of falling bodies, discovering a second power acceleration, out of which came Newton's 100 years later, putting those together and discovering the mass, the interaction between two celestial bodies but varying inversely as the second power of the arithmetical distances intervening. If you double the distance between them, you would decrease the interaction in one quarter of what it was. Professor Goddard had paid great attention to that. No, nobody did up to that time. <laughs> Goddard saw then that if we are, we are, we're already on a planet that's going around the sun, we're making 66,000 miles an hour around the sun right now. He said, we are also on board, so you and I are going around this personally, 66,000 miles an hour. And the bicycle lying on the ground is going around 66,000 miles an hour. <laughs> if I pick the bicycle up, stand up, and get on it and pedal it, I can go a little faster, and every time I go a little faster, it tries to leave the earth. That's why it gets stiffer and stiffer. So if I had some way of accelerating a vehicle, every time we doubled our distance away from the earth, we reduced the inter ten tendency to fall back in to one quarter what it was before. We don't have to go out there 
100 miles, 100 miles in relation to our planet Earth, 8,000 miles diameter is nothing, practically in the skin of it. The, out of this came then humanity beginning to operate in space. We've always been operating in space, but consciously operating in space. That's the era that Norman is taking us, leading us into <coughs> in the way of capabilities to cope with the very incredibly big patterns. Now, I want to recognize that all humans were then <coughs> always born naked, absolutely helpless for months, no experience, they were absolutely ignorant, given hunger and thirst <coughs> and curiosity to drive us to take initiatives, to learn only by trial and error. <laughs> we know of our planet probably being around four billion years old. We know of humans being on our planet for about only three million of the four billion years. We only have about 8,000 years of any knowledge of what has happened to humans on this little planet, so we know very, very little. <coughs> but what we have learned by trial and error has finally brought us to having these vocabularies, ability to communicate with one another. I feel then something about humanity. We, got, we use that beautiful mind now <coughs> to develop the capability to destroy all humanity in one half hour. You have to say, the universe brings us into it, give us extraordinary faculty just to develop the capability to destroy ourselves in half an hour. Out of the world that Norman was showing you, something's been going on, which has been going on since my birth. Nothing to do with my birth. I just happened to come in at an inflection point of history. <laughs> I came in when I was born to humanity. Reality was everything you could see, smell, touch, and hear. <laughs> you say, let me see it, I'm a realist. The year I was born, x-ray came in, you couldn't see it. The year I was born, wireless came in, you couldn't hear it and see it. <laughs> in the, when I was three, the electron was discovered. <laughs> when I was entering Harvard in 1913, my physics book had yellow pages pasted in the back called electricity. <laughs> We were entering an era of invisibility. <laughs> Today, 99.999% of everything is going to affect all of our lives tomorrow. The development is being conducted in the realms of reality, non direct or contactable by human senses. <laughs> Society has very little sense of what's really going on in this period, which Norman Foster has come into and really developed extraordinary leadership and, and being sure to pay attention to some of these gains. I'd like to point out in relation to s structures and building. We have always in the universe tendency to expand and contract. We're not operating perpendicular parallel, we're expanding and contracting. And in this expanding and contracting, the expansion, which we call radiation, brings about pressure, compression. And the gravity copes with the other tendency and pulls the things together. Gravity is tension, radiation is compression. And all building, all structuring, all interaction, all, every realization physically is, is an interplay of that push and pull. In the world of tension and building, compression, we, had, we entered the Stone Age, absolutely ignorant. We learned to put a stone on top of a stone, It'll sit there, we make a pile of stones high and try to put a stone on the side, it won't stay there, falls. Needed tension to hold it there. Throughout <coughs> then the early years of masonry and architecture, we had a 50,000 pounds per square inch compression resisting capability in masonry. The masonry had only 50 pounds tension strength. The best we could do for tension was wood, and the average available woods of any strength quantity or 10,000 pounds of square inch tensile strength against the 50,000 compression. As we had five times the capability compressively, we had tension. Everything we call architecture came out of that kind of a condition. 1851, we developed production steel for the first time. Production steel came to 50,000 tension. Tension came to parity with compression for the first time in history. A few years later, 1883, 
Roebling built this Brooklyn Bridge, and he got the uh, steel up to 70,000 with higher carbon. Mm -hmm. World War I, we got a chrome molybdenum steel for some of the aircraft tubing, 110,000, doubling the strength for the same weight of material. World War II, we came into chrome nickel steel, getting up to 350,000 tension capability, seven times that of mild steel for the same weight of material, same bulk. Absolutely invisible, new capability. <laughs> Most recently, we've gotten up to what are called carbon fibers, 600,000 pounds of square tensile strength, but they're put together in epoxy cement, and weight-wise, they're one quarter the weight of steel. So we have here 48 times the strength, <laughs> the bulk and weight of steel. And that's what I my crazy was able to have this little plane flown across the channel. Not one media, radio, television, newspaper, mention anything to do with increase in tensile capability. Just think on it. <laughs> because it's invisible. I find society highly specialized. They are specialists, you don't even see what's going on in the next laboratory. <laughs> so there's very little <coughs> integration of the information accruing to the doing more with less. Every, uh, more with every erg of energy, every pound of material, every second of time. Back in the opening of British Empire, after Trafalgar, 1805, the East India Company College was set up in just north east of here, <laughs> and all the data been collected for 200 years since the Magellan demonstrated around a sphere instead of on a plane. <laughs> All the data of exploring around the world, all the resources, all put in this great, wonderful East India Company College. Thomas Malthus made the professor of political economics. The first human in history to have the total vital statistics around a closed system sphere in contradistinction to being infinity. <laughs> Thomas Malthus realized it very powerfully. Came out with a conclusion, he said, the data makes it very clear humanity is reproducing itself at a geometrical rate, increasing it, and increasing its life support on an arithmetical rate, quite clearly the vast majority of humanity are doomed to have to go through life in great want and pain. Pay all you want, it won't do any good. That's all there is. It's a closed system. 98% of humanity was illiterate at the time. <laughs> Approximately nobody knew that Malthus said that. It's what I call highly classified information at the time, those ambitious to take over the wealth control. <laughs> Sixty years later, we have Darwin going around this planet and discovering there were no dragons, but there were all kinds of species, and developing a theory of evolution, survival of the fittest. <laughs> we have, by this time, information gathering quite rapidly. We have here, also contemporary with him, was Karl Marx, <laughs> beginning to examine some of the capabilities being used for those resources, developing his idea on capitalism. We have then socialists saying, and, and there was a, also the misassumption at that time, the two actual different classes of human beings, different blood structure. If you were in the royal one, you must always marry, keep, keep on with that blood structure. But the workers were something absolutely different, very dull. <laughs> there was a working assumption then that the worker was the fittest to survive on the part of the socialists, saying because they knew they knew how to handle the tools, knew how to nurture the seeds. They said these capitalists are parasites. Capitalists said, we go along with Darwin and Malthus too. We're on top of the heap for very good reason, we're the fittest. <laughs> the workers are dull, no imagination, no daring, no venture. We're just full of it. <laughs> Life needs it very badly. That became the essence of, I'm talking now only 100 years ago. <laughs> Since that last 100 years, the humans on our little planet here in space, we've had the work inception it had to be you or me. <laughs> and all, po all political economics are based on it. it has to be you or me. Which policy do you pursue? pursue? Uh, you're going, who's, who, which society is going to have to die? <laughs> what was not foreseen at that time, along came the telegraph, 1810, just after Malthus said what he said. <laughs> we began to do a lot more with less, invisibly. <laughs> and now we've come into an era when I began to become, I became very excited in the 
time of World War I, was coming using alloys where people couldn't see the strength. <laughs> and I realized there was a possibility that someday we might be able to do so much with so little. <laughs> we might be able to take care of everybody. In the meantime, world society has been actually deliberately channeled into specialization. <laughs> Every human being is born with that beautiful mind. That mind wants to, to understand their interrelationships. We have then power structure of yesterday, way, way back, needing the brilliance of the good mind, but scared to death of it. Fundamental policy of all power structure, just instinctively, divide to conquer. And to keep conquered, keep divided. So we have all of our specialization, our education, education systems keep all the bright ones specialized. We're such a, here we are, a very extraordinary matter. I've been keeping track of all those technologies, their gains, and ever since World War I when I was regular United States Navy. I've got myself into technology of more environment controlling with less. Come into something like we have things in parallel sitting on night bricks open, <laughs> may have a, a <coughs> water tank with all the staves in parallel, <laughs> they go to infinity, open to infinity. But when you bring three together, <laughs> you have stability for the first time in history, triangulation. And all we now know, <coughs> I'm going to have to say something fairly important here, though the Greeks give us solids, and you all talk solids a whole lot still, Physics has found there are no solids. The electron is a remote from its nucleus, as is the Earth from the moon in relative diameters. We're in a universe where nothing touches anything else. While Newton then did find, find the, the mathematics of this interrelationship of celestial bodies, we haven't realized that's what's going on in all those alloys there, too. There's an extraordinary invisible structuring of atomic structures. Anyway, I've kept track of these things, and the point is that if there are no solids, there also are no spheres. And the sphere is defined by the Greeks as a surface equidistant all directions from a point. It has to be solid to have all directions from a point. We now know there are only something we call spheric experiences, but they are all of them poly, not polyhedra anymore, because there are no solids. They're polyvertexia. <laughs> this is something very simple I'm saying, but absolutely germane because When we make a sphere, a sphere is simply an aggregate of triangles. <laughs> That's all it's, it's a polyvertex here, aggregate of triangles, where the sums of the angles around any vertex is always less than 360 degrees. <laughs> That's all there is about it. That's all there is. When you say spherical, you mean that. You mean untriangulated. When you first developed the first geodesic dome, the two largest domes in the world, which are still existent, St. Peter's, in Rome and the Pantheon. St. Ro the Pantheon having not the chain that the St. Peter's had around to keep take care of the thrust, just having an enormous mass of masonry. St. Peter's is in the realm of 30,000 tons, somewhere in the realm then of the weight of the Queen Elizabeth II. <laughs> when I built the first geodesic dome of 150 feet, came out 30 tons. I said, one one thousandth the weight. And I found no, the media doesn't talk about weight. I have been trying very hard to get the world of architecture, the accrediting boards of the other societies, to require that all drawings on any building, made by any draftsman or any architecture student, always have the weights of the materials. I'm sure that we've been through this business before. But at any rate, I want to realize that in the world that Norman came into, was one where 1970 we crossed a threshold where it could be demonstrated engineering wise that if for 10 years we took all the metals now going into armaments and put them into what I call living room, within 10 years we could have all humanity living the highest standard of living anybody ever known on a completely sustainable basis while phasing out all further use of fossil fuels and atomic energy. In other words, I 
as of 1970, became engineeringly evident if you kept track of the whole thing on a total planetary basis and all these invisibles. The first time in history, it did not have to be you and me. It was adequate for both. The war became obsolete. But you couldn't get that word around because everybody's so specialized that no, no specialist can look and say, he understands, I think, because it's all invisible. I have a terribly responsible, great responsibility when Norman asked me to stand up here and speak to be sure that you really know we do have the option to make it versus blowing ourselves to get pieces in half an hour. I have to think about the total picture of humanity and incredible changes that I've witnessed. I've gone through, when I was born, humanity was 95% illiterate. Since I was born, the population has doubled, but the total world population is now 65% literate. If you're all illiterate, you need leaders. I have some completely new set of conditions challenging us here. The voc vocabulary of the average working man when I was before World War I, around the most 300 words, well, half of it blasphemous I've seen. We have the average six-year-old child in America and around the world has a vocabulary of 4,000 words. <laughs> Complete change of our ability to acquire knowledge and to communicate. I find uh, there's a moving picture that I've seen in California several times made with x-ray of the development of a chick inside of an egg, a bird's chick inside of an egg. The first thing that begins to happen, as you notice, is it gets to be a pulsing. And this pulsation becomes a heart. Finally, that pulsing of the whole mass that centralizes in, in the heart area. You see the eyes developing. Gradually, the whole chick is developed. The chick is all absolutely complete inside the egg. It doesn't know anything about the rest of the world. And it needs nutriment and starts pecking and, and, and then breaks open the eggshell. There it has wings and legs. Humanity is where we have those wings and legs today. We're just coming out of a group eggshell. What is really terribly important to me about this meeting here today, giving Norman the gold medal very, very appropriately, was the talk that he gave that went with it. That he could give that kind of a talk and have this audience understand and clap as they did. It means we have a very great deal of knowledge, great comprehension today of our potentials. I think all humanity is in now in a, what I call final examination. The invention of humans in the universe, the inclusion of them, giving them access to the great design laws of universe, which we could get down to either destroying ourselves or now where we have the opportunity to take care of everybody and live in the universe entirely in a new kind of way. Here we are, this crisis. So I say, Humans are in judgment as, as individuals, not as either by political systems, not as economic systems. But human build, uh, what kind of integrity do humans really have? How much courage do they have to go really along with the truth? To take the trouble when I tell you we do have the option to find out whether that's so. <laughs> See, we're going to, uh, if we're going to just use this to blow ourselves up, well, that's the simply the way nature is arranged to get rid of us because we were, we were just a bad experiment. <laughs> Norman, I've said really a, a whole lot. I didn't know I was going to talk this way when I got up here. <laughs> I, I, want to, I want to add in that we come out of World War II into a new architecture phase when we are, Norman is building a building and halfway around the world, <laughs> 180 degrees away. <laughs> this is getting to be more or less in common practice, but it's very typical. But one of the most important parts of it to me is the fact that after World War II, girls just began to start going to the architecture schools. I've now been a guest professor at over 550 university colleges around the world, they're architecture schools. And so I'm more and more girls coming in. And it's very, very exciting to me that Norman's wife is a beautiful architect, grew up in the architecture school with him. I think it's about time for humanity to understand, because man has been out there using his fist and, and operating ignorantly. So men were more equipped to do that. But we've overlooked the fact that women are continuous. Men are discontinuous. Life comes out of the woman. And the, the thoughtfulness that 
went into that work that Norman was showing you was an enormous product of, the, of the, having an extraordinarily beautiful, wonderful wife to inspire him. I'd like to, I'd like, really like to have some very much of an applause for her. May I have your applause for her? <laughs> mm -hmm. Down, stand up, get her stand up. Stand, stand up. <laughs> Customs are beautiful. The RIB is a beautiful custom. And it isn't easy to change those customs. I suggested to the president of RIBA before we came down, they might have her stand up at the same time that Norman received the gold medal. <laughs> really appropriate, but the customs are too strong, you couldn't possibly do that, Shane. <laughs> wasn't, he wasn't appreciative of what I was saying at all. But I'd like, if possible, to have you feel with me the following. When I was 28 years of age, Hubble discovered another galaxy. We had our Milky Way. We didn't know there was anything but the Milky Way. Hubble discovered another galaxy. Remember, that's when I was 28. <laughs> I was in this century. <laughs> 1925, what it was. I think 1926, the date was. Anyway, since that time, up to this last year, we discovered two billion more galaxies, over 100 billion stars average. And during the last year, we've discovered 200 billion more galaxies. <laughs> I'm wondering why we've gone into the microcosm in exactly the same way, but we haven't caught on to seeing the individual atoms and not realizing the interrelationships between them following the same Newtonian laws, and that's why we have the extraordinary kind of alloys that we have. Anyway, darling, beautiful people, I, I really overstepped my time. You gave me 10 minutes, and I... I haven't been too much of it. <laughs> I'm giving you about 20 minutes of it. And anyway, architects have a very extraordinary responsibility in the era of specialization. They really do have a responsibility putting things together to deal in complexities. And Norman's whole discourse made it clear how much he really had to comp cope with the enormous amount of information to be coped with and to cope with really effectively. We do have the computer, and the computer's going to make a lot of differences. But darling people, I want you to realize that in the area of specialization, the architect is really all we have whose business is with everything. <laughs> and you have not been able to exercise very much because big money has been running. In the last 18 years, i traveling around, the, I've been around the world now 50 times, exactly 50. And I've seen in the last 18 years, a sudden thing, all these bu buildings coming up. <laughs> Bangkok, which is a lovely little canal city, suddenly filled up the canals, and there's all these great skyscrapers. They're everywhere. And why are they? I had a man from BBC come and interview me today about skyscrapers. They're there because that's the way you make most money with your land. Nothing to do with what's good for humanity. <laughs> We are in a very critical condition in all these kind of ways, and I'm confident you can't make good judgments and understand what's going on in the world if you have prejudices, you have good and bad people. You must really try to see what is going on, absolutely honestly, what is going on, talk about it that way, but see if you can what evolution is trying to do, what is the universe trying to do? Because quite clearly to me, humans did not invent humans. <laughs> humans did not invent gravity. They didn't invent the 92 chemical elements. They didn't invent anything. Now, ego is enormous. <laughs> we kind of think we, we have to carry on our system as it is. I saw long ago that the grass didn't have to pay the clouds for the rain. In fact, the game of money is an incredibly small game. Unfortunately, money is found, you, the most, you make the most money with armaments. And that's why we keep on with this n nuisance side of things. But you must all learn your own facts about this and be able to really talk and make decisions that are really are going to count. Are humans going to stay on this planet or not? It depends on your personal, individual integrity. I'm going to give you an examination I often give. You'll find if you take tubes, say aluminum tubes, 12 inches long, 
half an inch in diameter, and string them together with a Dacron cord, make a long necklace. You find that the, 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 the tubes are not bending, the tubes are not getting shorter or longer. What is bending is, it, is it, the Dacron cord in the joints. So you take out co uh, tubes one, one by one, see if you can isolate what really is going on here. You get down to, say, five, and it's still the necklace. Get down to four, you fold up parallel. To, remember when the teacher went to the blackboard and took those four and made it into a square? Because I can also shape them into a square. And she said it's, it's square, and it only stays square because the blackboard held it there. Because <laughs> it has no innate capability to hold a shape. There's no such thing as a square. I take out one more tube, still has the flexible corners, and suddenly holds its shape. We call it a triangle. <laughs> it's not a triangle that's holding its shape because you have gusset plates at the corners. <laughs> Those are absolutely flexible corners. It's the minimum polyhedron, polygon, <laughs> it's the only one holds its shape. Anything in the universe that you've ever said, I recognize that shape, has to go back to a triangle. <laughs> Now, I've given you about, about a triangle. And we want to know why it holds its shape that way. Very good idea. You learned about the lever long ago. <laughs> learned you can take two levers, make them of steel, you can sharpen them up and put them together with a common fulcrum, and you have a pair of scissors. And the longer the handles, the more powerful the shears. You'll find that your triangle with those three sets of tubes, you take hold of one tube, is taking hold of the ends of the other tubes and with minimum effort stabilizing the opposite angle. I find physics and engineering have no definition of what they mean by a structure. A structure is a complex of events that interact to produce a stable pattern. Now, I'm going to also give you this, you must do it in your minds. I'm going to make a triangle. Now I'm going to make a triangle a little bigger. Edge reads two. Add a little, little triangle at the top. I'm pointing to the center of gravity of the triangle. One little triangle, two, three, four. Edge reads two and reads four triangles in there, right? I'm going to make the edge read three. Point to the center of gravity. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now I'm going to make edges four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. You can say triangling instead of squaring. Now, I've just demonstrated to you experimental evidence that only a triangle holds its shape. Nature is continually second powering. Two of the greatest laws we have, Isaac Newton's inverse ratio of the second power of the relative proximity, we have radiation law from Einstein, E equals MC, the second power, little c means radio, radio speed of light. But light goes in all directions, and the gravity reaches in all directions. That's why I have to have a second power. Nature is continually second powering. I'm saying to you, and personally, I've given you some experimental evidence just now. Every square is two triangles. Nature is always most economical. When nature is second powering, is she triangling or squaring? Answer me. If you, if you don't have the integrity and guts to go along with experimental evidence, we're all through. Nature is triangling, she never does anything else. That's all she can do. There's no other shape that holds the shape. I'm really shocked to you. The first audience I've had that didn't finally agree to say triangling. <laughs> I say, if, if this is very bad, <laughs> my great designers, architects in the world, <laughs> if you don't dare go along with experimental evidence, we're all through. I said, we're going to stay here if we have integrity. Integrity really go along with the truth as we find it. Because they taught you that in school, doesn't mean you have to go along with it. <laughs> uh, simply, I've given you some very sharp experimental evidence data coming out of what we call pure scientific mathematics, where you deal only in experimental evidence. No, no uh, working, working hypothesis. All right, dear, dear people. It's a pretty severe note at the end of Norman. But Norman's talk and his work, and his work around the world, are manifest of the highest integrity and courage to really go along with the information we have. That's the very essence of our meeting here today. Norman, I really salute you for 
your example of integrity. <laughs> Dear people, I hope you all have it. I'd like to see you tomorrow. Bye. He ran quite a lot over time, and I suspect that had I have interrupted him, I'd have been the most unpopular man in the poll. <laughs> it's been a very memorable evening. Thank you, Sir Robert. Thank you, Bucky Fuller. Well, I should have probably said, in case you didn't know, he's indeed a RIBA gold medalist himself. But above all, thank you, Norman Foster, Royal Gold Medalist for 1983. And thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs>